Thank you for the warm introduction, Jess. It's great to be here today. Um, so yes, as just uh, mentioned, I really do want to pick up from what we've been talking about today about how we do regulation in a digital world. Particularly, I think, how we work through the new relationships between users, between governments, and between private companies. The thesis of my talk is that I think that we are at a constitutional moment, one of these rare opportunities where we get to rethink the fundamental relationships between members of society to figure out how we want to be governed in the future. Four main points today. The first, that intermediaries, by which I mean content hosts, internet service providers, platforms, they all govern our online environments, and they themselves are influenced in turn by a wide range of both public and non-state actors. The second point, which I think we can deal with relatively quickly, is that regulation is coming. Anyone all of you who have been paying attention in this area know that governments around the world are keen to intervene with how the internet is regulated and how private companies influence what their users do, can see, and can say online. Then third, the normative component. I think we need what I call a new constitutionalism a way to ensure that we have fair, accountable, and participatory means to make and enforce the rules that impact on our everyday lives and our fundamental rights. The last point I want to leave you with at the end is that the only way I think we get here is through a tremendous amount of work that requires the intense cooperation across civil society, across private industry, and across government regulation. So I want to start today with the make this full screen. With the tragic example of Heather Heyer, who was murdered at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville a few years ago. This is, uh, this is a, a, a tragic set of circumstances that kicked off what is really an interesting and new um, stage in the discussion about the role of private intermediaries and particularly infrastructure companies in regulating speech online. Heather's death was celebrated on the neo-Nazi website, The Daily Stormer, a site that the Southern Poverty Law Center has called uh, the most popular English language radical right website in the world, which was influential in organizing the rallies, but also was used after the rally to spread disinformation about the circumstances that led to Heather Heyer's death. This sparked a lot of outrage around the world that the site's editor and the site's users were celebrating this tragic uh, loss and using it indeed to further incent hatred amongst the site's readers and the general public. So at this point, the what we saw was that the infrastructure companies made a public decision to intervene. And this is something that infrastructure companies have done sometimes in the past, but usually not in such, under such intense public scrutiny. So the domain name was cancelled by GoDaddy. It was then re-registered with Google. Google cancelled it and put it on administrative hold, making that name unavailable to be transferred to another service provider. The hosting service that was provided by the VPS provider DigitalOcean was, was dropped according to their terms of contract. And most interestingly, perhaps, Cloudflare made a decision to stop providing caching and mirroring services. So for those of you who... Um, uh, who may not um, be, who may not uh, have a good understanding of how these systems work. What's interesting about the Daily Stormers is that previously, if you host your own website on your own virtual private server, it's very hard, unless you're actually clearly breaking the law in the jurisdiction that you're based, to uh, have someone exercise restrictions over the content. And so the infrastructure companies here making a decision not at the content level of individual posts, like we might see someone like Facebook do, but at the service level of the entire website is a really interesting 
and quite large move. Cloudflare provide um, protection against distributed denial of service attacks. If you run a high profile website on the internet, particularly a high profile controversial website, you need protection from people who would try to take you offline through coordinated de denial of service attacks. That's Cloudflare's big job in this realm. Indeed, Cloudflare's decision was in part uh, prompted by someone who emailed their CEO and said, please get out of the way so that we can DDoS this site off the internet. What's interesting about this case is not so much the discrete decision, but the way that the infrastructure companies started conceptualising how they talk about the regulatory role that they play in making decisions to take things offline. Matthew Prince, CEO of Cloudflare, says, this was my decision and my rationale is simple. The people behind the Daily Stormer are assholes and I had had enough. <laughs> he goes on, let me be clear, this is an arbitrary decision. He woke up in a bad mood and decided that someone shouldn't be on the internet. In a reflective turn says no one should have that power. This is a really interesting problem that tech companies are working through right now in working out how they are exercising the massive power that they wield over what we can see and say online. Fundamentally, my point here is that these are all problems of accountability and due process, and they're only going to get more important. We've already heard this morning about all of the different areas of law uh, and concern within society that prompts, uh, that is currently prompting a rethink of how we regulate the internet. Whether this is misinformation, election interference, copyright infringement, content classification, abuse, harassment, and stalking, so on. We have ongoing policy reforms, not just in Australia, but all over the world, to reshape the laws uh, that apply primarily to internet intermediaries that then are forced to apply those rules to monitor the um, and influence the behavior of their users. So the point here, the descriptive point, is that internet intermediaries are the focal points of control. That it is too costly, expensive, legally difficult to enforce the law directly against individuals. In copyright, I might add that it's incredibly unpopular. You remember the, um, the disastrous attempts by the RIAA to sue individual users, uh, file sharers, in the mid-2000s. Uh, it's not a great way to regulate content. So the pressure is on internet intermediaries. We used to think that the internet was somewhat unregulable. And the, the lie there is that infrastructure has always been subject to the power of the state. States have always regulated telecommunications by regulating the physical pipes and connections through which that exist on physical land, which is in the jurisdictions of the states. What's changing is that states are getting more sophisticated. Um, this is the example of the Snowden re revelations of exactly how sophisticated the National Security Agency in the US has become at um, so developing a surveillance, a global surveillance network that directly exploits the pipes and um, telecommunications infrastructure that is privately owned around the world. We also see states becoming more sophisticated at the content level. Here is the example that Turkey um, has for a long time been one of the leaders in getting Twitter to remove content. And that's something that concerns a lot of people given Turkey's quite shockingly low record in press freedom. And so we are seeing countries around the world learn on how to influence the companies that allow us to communicate at the content layer in a way that furthers their, their particular regulatory objectives. Sometimes we might think of that uh, as, a, as a good thing in terms of encouraging the, uh, and supporting the democratically created legislation and the, the due process of law. 
Other times we might have more concerns on human rights grounds about what exactly is being removed. At the same time, private actors too have become much more sophisticated at getting protection for their rights embedded in the technology. So we've seen waves of the last 20 years of the copyright wars, we have seen an evolution in strategy by rights holders. First, to sue the, um, the creators of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services like Napster and so on. Um, that strategy eventually stops working when you run out of people to sue. So ultimately, the goal of recent years of, pro of providers has been, one, to work on the infrastructure layer. We heard the minister this morning talking about um, website blocking as an example of infrastructure regulation for copyright. Um, and two, to work with partnerships. Um, Professor Chandler spoke about uh, Google and YouTube's $3 billion in partnerships for, uh, for the music industry. What that, what's happened in that evolution is that the protection for copyright interests has been baked into content ID and the DMCA process that regulates content online in a way that's mutually beneficial but also not necessarily um, or doesn't have the same level of public oversight that we normally expect of legal regulation. Overall, the point is that people uh, care about these issues and they're increasingly matters of everyday concern for ordinary users. Not a week goes by without another scandal about how the platforms are regulating speech. And they're in a very difficult position here in that platforms are being pushed and pulled in many different ways and don't have a lot of certainty to guide them about how they enforce their decisions. So there's a, at the same time, the lack of transparency in these systems has only given fuel to the fire that there are allegations, widespread allegations of, of both bias and downright mistaken policy choices made by platforms that have not been sufficiently open about how their systems operate to moderate content, to make it visible, or to make it less visible. Okay, point two. Regulation is definitely coming. I think this largely speaks for itself. We've spoken a little bit about this this morning. State, we are beyond the point where I think platforms are, and, in, and internet intermediaries more generally, are free to make choices about how they regulate their networks in secret and in, in private context. Whether they may have the legal power, but they are losing the public legitimacy, the trust of the people and of regulators uh, through that process, of, of, through a long history of doing this secretly. And I think that's, that's no secret now, that everyone acknowledges you see Zuckerberg acknowledging this problem, saying we want to be regulated. Where Facebook is sick of having to make these decisions by itself and it wants a set of clear legal standards that it can apply and then deflect any concerns. At the moment, the concerns come home to Facebook, that when Facebook makes a decision, that's a decision that was set for its own particular policy objectives. When Zuckerberg says, they want to be regulated, it's a way of ensuring that the criticism for the way the rules are created and enforced is dealt with through some sort of external public political process. It's obviously not going to be that simple, but we are seeing a point right now, this year, where we will see a lot of regulation all around the world on a lot of different fronts that try to get platforms and other internet intermediaries to do more to regulate behaviour. The problem is no one agrees on exactly what we should be asking of them. And that makes the, um, that makes the legal landscape very complicated. Uh, it creates a lot of uncertainty, but it also creates real conflict of laws, problems, substantive problems about uh, what standards we expect and what protections we expect for competing rights, whether they're the, to take something like hate speech, for example, um, different people will come to different opinions about 
uh, the way you draw a line between what is hateful and what is lawful political or, or um, um, expression. So all across all of these different areas, we are seeing a lot of movement. Let me give you a quick case study of how difficult this is. After the Christchurch massacre um, mid last year or early last year, we saw two different regulatory responses from New Zealand and from Australia. The background here is that the gunman in the Christchurch massacre live streamed the material on Facebook, live streamed the, um, the killings on Facebook. The, the videos weren't reported until after the conclusion of the event. And they were removed, I think, about an, an hour and five, an hour and six minutes um, after, or they, they were first removed about an hour and six minutes after they were started. One hour, Facebook says, is actually, you know, relative, really quick for, for the moderation systems that Facebook has in place. But the uh, New Zealand and the Australian governments view that as, as not quick enough as a response and that perhaps they need to rethink the way that they design their systems to be able to act more quickly. This is complicated because you take down one copy of the video and a lot more pop up. So you're, again, like in the copyright world, playing whack-a-mole, trying to remove content again and again against determined actors who are trying, who are manipulating the video to make it harder to detect and, try, and continuously trying to push it up, not just through Facebook, but all around, um, all around the world through different platforms. So this is an intensely complicated regulatory problem. The New Zealand response was that we needed an industry-led or a co-regulatory uh, approach. That um, just in the Prime Minister Ardern started um, joined with the with the French um, initiatives to create what's known as the Christchurch Call, which is a non-binding code of conduct that aims to improve uh, policies and practices for uh, the dissemination of hateful content, amongst other things. In Australia, we went a different direction um, and created the Abhorrent Violent Material Act. And this approach was done by contrast with no consultation and just creates a lot of, a very strong um, criminal penalty on executives who don't, who knowingly host or don't uh, quickly enough remove content that is abhorrent violent material. The difficulty here is in working out what exactly is covered by this phrase and how um, how it is, one, defined, but more importantly, implemented by content providers. So the definition of abhorrent violent conduct is material that, that, is, that includes things like torture and, and murder and so on, things that we think of as, as abhorrent, um, is offensive, which is a fairly loose word, but has been interpreted by courts in the past, and filmed or recorded by someone who's involved in the act. Very steep penalties. I'm going to show a picture now of something which comes within this definition, um, but that I think most of us would agree is important in the public interest to be displayed. Uh, if, you're, if you are concerned, please look away for the next 60 seconds. But this is an image of the Abu Ghraib um, torture, the torture by American soldiers in, of people in Iraq um, that was recorded by the soldiers themselves. It is clearly abhorrent violent material in that it depicts torture. It is taken by the people who are torturing the, the subjects, and, um, and, and it's uh, likely to be offensive. It's a little hard to work out what exactly offensive means in those circumstances, but certainly I find this offensive. So, but I also think that this is really important material to be up on the public record. And the problem with the abhorrent violent material bill in the way that it was current, it was drafted, and this is, this is acknowledged as a part of the Part of the process that the government went through to create legislation very quickly in response to the Christchurch um, massacre is that it, does, it doesn't contain the safeguards that we would expect for freedom of expression and important things in the public interest. So if 
an organization like, say, Wikipedia were hosting this image, or the National Library were hosting this image, there is no exception that applies. The exceptions that apply apply only for journalists in particular. Uh, I think that's a massive problem because what it means is even if the law is not routinely enforced, we haven't seen any prosecutions under this law, a rational host will make decisions to host less of this material because the, um, because the penalties are so extreme, three years imprisonment for the people responsible. So I think this case study is an example of one, the interest that people have in forcing platform companies to do more to respond to public outrage about the material on their, on, on their networks, but two, also the great legal difficulty of creating a set of incentives that gets the balance right in terms of creating clarity for what exactly we think is, should be, or should not be prohibited, and in terms of ensuring that there is adequate there is an adequate mechanism of appeal and due process as a safety valve when things go wrong. So other governments have taken other routes to the same sort of general problem. Um, this is the, the French President Macron um, has worked to get uh, French regulators directly within Facebook to observe how they're making decisions about content, how they're setting policy, and ultimately to influence how they set and enforce policy for people in France. This is the stage where we're at at the moment, where governments around the world are looking for solutions that are effective. My point here is that this is always going to be messy. There is a certain limited category of speech that we can think of as clearly unlawful. Some of that is easy to identify. Um, the, the worst of the worst child exploitation material is easy to identify and we have hash matching databases and so on that can, that can pick that up and regulate that in a, in a relatively effective way with limited um, limited contestation about what exactly should and should not be prohibited. Everything else is actually quite hard, you know. We've got copyright material where, which is usually dealt with by an allegation of the copyright owners. In the overwhelming majority of cases, those allegations are correct, but in some proportion of cases, they're wrong. Defamation, which is very difficult for a, um, for a platform company to evaluate because you have to evaluate the defenses to defamation, the um, public interest just, de de justifications uh, of truth, for example. It's incredibly difficult for a platform to make that call about whether the material is unlawful. So the boundaries start to get quite rapidly more fuzzy as you move out from that clear core of prohibited material. Then you've got a broader content, broader category of content that's prohibited by the terms of service of platforms, but it's not unlawful to carry. And you might think of the Daily Stormer material in this um, category, that the, the terms of service are written to give organizations like Cloudflare the ability, the discretion, to um, refuse to provide service in the future for material they don't agree with for various grounds. But it's not unlawful under the terms of US law. And then you have broader categories of speech that people might reasonably disagree on whether they think it should be on major commercial social media platforms and other parts of the internet that are not prohibited, but that where we think that platforms ought to be doing more to remove or ought to be doing more to protect contested speech. The issue is that these will never be able to get to a point where you have an easy way to classify the content that is posted online. The scale is too large and the subject matter itself means that there will always be a lot of grey area. When you think about this in terms of scale, let's take content, um, sorry, the DMCA notices for a start. Google now processes, I think this is out of date, over 80 million takedown requests every month for copyright content. Now, most of this, as I said, um, may well be very legitimate, right? The systems we have in place, if we aim for an accuracy of 98, 99% is where we're looking at for, um, for machine learning accuracy on these types of content um, 
to evaluate the, the validity of these types of takedown requests, even that means that you're making hundreds of thousands of mistakes every month. Um, it's the same when you're dealing with uh, other types of harmful content. The, we, we are dealing with major problems of scale. Things will slip through either by accident or as a result of coordinated work by the people who are trying to exploit these systems. Ultimately, what this means, I think, is a concern around process. How do you fix inevitable mistakes in a way that's legitimate? I think the point here for me is that there is often a fundamental trade-off between your accuracy, which is defined when you're, when you're building content moderation systems. Accuracy is essentially defined as uh, do similar people come to similar decisions on the same piece of content under the same rules. At this scale, there's a fundamental trade-off between that accuracy metric and the sensitivity to the context. This is an example of Celeste Little, an Arente woman who, uh, and an activist who was banned from Facebook for um, posting images of tribal elders uh, in, yeah, in, in, desert, in, in a desert um, in, a, in a ceremony. Um, what we see here is a concern about the application of Facebook's rules. Facebook rule is clear that um, it prohibits, well, it's, not, it's, it's somewhat clear that it prohibits some forms of nudity. And over the years, it has added more clarity to what forms of nudity it prohibits. But it's really difficult for automated systems, certainly, and also human moderators to make decisions about the context in which we think certain types of material might be permissible. It's a, that contextual decision making is, is not something that we can automate. And it's something that's currently not done very well with the commercial content moderation processes. It needs more, um, it needs longer and more detailed processes of appeal to work through the fundamental problems. So that's where we are. I think the answer is we need to rethink relationships. My thesis here is that we need a new constitutionalism. Constitutionalism I use to refer to how we regulate the exercise of power. How we create rules that recognize that private actors play an important role in regulating content online, but how we ensure that the way that that power is exercised is done in a way that protects innovation, that protects um, due process, that promotes transparency and protects human rights. The way we've done this in the past has not been great. Um, historically, this has all been dealt with under terms of service clauses, which ultimately reserve all power and discretion to the platforms. As Zuckerberg himself acknowledged in 2012, these are a bad way that, uh, to, to govern communities. The terms of service set the fundamental constitutional relationships, uh, the governing documents that people, that in Facebook's case, two billion people, monthly active users live with each day. And so if we think about these as constitutional documents and we think about constitutional processes, we need to rethink how we actually embed constitutional safeguards in the way that private rules are enforced and in the way that private companies are pressured by other actors to control and influence what users are doing. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but. We are at a moment of change where I think all of the major tech companies recognize that the secretive way in which rules were made and enforced in the past is no longer standing up to the intense public scrutiny and concern around the world. The problem is we haven't yet got to the point where we can evaluate how well decisions are being made. Transparency is improving, I'll show you a little bit on that later on, but we don't have great granular information about decisions to moderate content, to de-rank content, to amplify content, to recommend or to remove content online. That 
is still dealt with through private processes that are opaque to both users and, um, and researchers and policymakers around the world. I think this is changing. To give credit to many of the platforms, this is rapidly changing in that at least the, um, the notices that are given to users are now much better than they were. The rules are much clearer uh, and explained in much clearer terms than they previously were. But there's still a little bit of work, there's still quite a lot of way to go to make this system, make these systems more legitimate. So let's go another year from the Daily Stormer example, where Cloudflare again makes a decision to drop 8chan. What's striking here is that Matthew Prince Cloudflare has been having these conversations in public for a long time, for at least a year in between these two events, but we haven't really seen much advancement in the public discourse. So here again, we get to a decision by Cloudflare to drop 8chan in the face of intense public pressure about what its users are posting. The point here is Prince says what's hard is defining policy where we can enforce in a way that's transparent and consistent. This is a really tough challenge. He says this is a problem of the rule of law. The idea that um, the rule of law requires policy that should be transparent and consistent. It's usually a framework that's applied to governments to make sure that state action is state power is exercised in a legitimate way, but we see now private companies using these concepts to work through what is important when they make their rules and when they enforce their rules so that they can justify them not only to their users but to the general public. So going into the rule of law, you can think of it as including a, a couple of basic prospects, a couple of basic principles that there is some meaningful consent in that the rules are clear and known, that there's some consultation on the changes and there's real choice in setting, in, in agreeing whether to abide by the rules. You can think of the requirement of transparency, that governors are held accountable in some way for their decisions. You can measure it in terms of is it applied equally and predictably? Are the rules consistently and fairly applied? And then the due process element, is there a mechanism to ensure that when mistakes are inevitably made by people acting with the best of intentions, that they can be corrected? The more, much more contested component is that also the rules are, have to justify, have to present some justifiable vision of what the group of people who are regulated believe to be the common good. That's much harder on, a community, on, on platforms of two billion users than on smaller platforms, but it does mean that there are substantive requirements, not just procedural requirements to the rule of law, that say the rules have to help us live a good life or, or create a society that we think is worth living in. So I said that the platforms have been investing heavily in transparency reports, and I think this is great that um, we've seen leadership by YouTube in particular on transparency reporting, by Facebook on, on their new reporting, uh, on terms of service reports. Um, that telcos are starting to provide more transparency about how they govern their networks. For a long time, this was limited to state requests to remove content or identify individuals and to copyright. Uh, removal requests. We're now seeing a lot more information about the general trends about complaints under terms of service for harmful speech. This is a, a, a positive move. We're also seeing innovations at the firms themselves. Facebook has, uh, or has said that it will launch sometime this year an oversight board, an independent body um, that when Zuckerberg first introduced it was billed as the uh, the Supreme Court of Facebook. That language isn't used so much anymore, but um, this is a body of independent experts that are appointed by an independent trust that is endowed for a long enough period to maintain its independence by Facebook, 
and that they will hear, they will choose and hear cases about Facebook's enforcement of its own rules. Those decisions of that oversight board will be binding in the particular case against Facebook and they're also able to provide recommendations for the more general case. So I find this fascinating as an innovation in thinking through legitimacy. Facebook spent a long time over the last year really genuine commitment to thinking about how it might create an oversight process that can be demonstrated to be legitimate. Not everyone's going to agree with the decisions the oversight board makes, but it's a procedural innovation to help provide that external check on power that is currently missing from internal appeals mechanisms. I think this is a really interesting time. It's also politically interesting because obviously Facebook, like the other companies, are facing a lot of regulatory pressure. They're, the reason we're seeing this innovation now is because we are at a moment where real legal regulation is just around the corner and the companies are working to find mechanisms that they can live with that also increase legitimacy and trust in their processes. I'm going to leave you with the more pessimistic note. If I was optimistic on the last development, I'm still a little bit pessimistic about how we really bake in human rights into these governance processes. The example here is of hate speech against Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, um, state-sponsored hate speech that was disseminated through all of the media, and both physical and digital media in Myanmar, but in which Facebook played some sort of important role. The, um, the, the UN fact-finding mission called it a, a determining role in spreading um, hate speech that led to the genocide of uh, Rohingya Muslim populations. In part, this came about because of some naivety that really can't be excused in this late in the game. Um, firm, one, of the, one of the challenges was that Facebook didn't... Facebook didn't build the... Um, didn't have in place the content moderation systems that would enable it to understand the Burmese language uh, or did not have the moderators, moderation teams in place with sufficient local context to understand the hate speech that was spreading. The other part was a technical problem. The, um, the, the particular font that was used to encode the Burmese script wasn't a Unicode font and doesn't play well with the machine learning systems that Facebook has developed over the years. But mainly, this is a failure to consider in advance the challenges of entering a new market without sufficient understanding about its impact on the ground. We saw this, we saw Yahoo go through this in 2007 when it was forced to hand over the information of Chinese dissidents. At that point, um, at that point, the industry came together to create the Global Network Initiative that required it to go through human rights impact assessments about expansions into new territories and changes to their features. What saddens me here is that Facebook should have seen this coming, that if they had done their human rights due diligence, they might not have been able to predict the exact use of their services by determined coalitions of state and non-state actors to spread misinformation and hate, but they should have been able to see the flaws in their rollout beforehand. And so I think this is another warning about making sure that we have, at the design stage, at the conceptualization, conceptualization at the product rollout stage, and the development processes and the deployment processes, we bring in attention about how the technologies that we are building will impact on the human rights of people. I think this is a sobering warning that we still have a long way to go. I think we have an opportunity here. I think we have an opportunity to do more, but because there's so much pressure. This is an example of 
um, from Robert Gorwa's work about the different regulatory initiatives that come from state, private civil society and, and private actors that are trying to influence how um, the internet is regulated. There's a lot of pressure, but we have to figure out how to exercise that in a way that will lead us to good rules, rules that protect human rights, rules that enable us to flourish, rules that protect what we think is important about being governed online. For us, I think that means we need a lot of pressure from civil society to continue to do the work to hold both platforms and those who would influence platforms accountable. This is Ranking Digital Rights. They do a fantastic job of evaluating the policies of different telcos and tech companies on freedom of expression and privacy grounds. We see many examples like this that I think are really important. The Santa Clara principles I had some role in um, set out the sort of minimum standards for transparency reporting that we think are required in order to answer questions like, is the moderation system biased? Or uh, who is trying to exploit these moderation systems? Uh, or that provide enough information about how you would appeal the removal of content uh, if you have been affected by it. I also think there's a lot of academic work. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there is academic work to be done to bring more accountability to these previously quite hidden processes. Um, we've built some infrastructure. I, I should plug the great work by three of my postdocs. Alice Witt is doing fantastic work to evaluate potential and apparent bias in, uh, in how Instagram moderates women's uh, images of modern images of women's bodies. Joe Gray has developed some great machine learning techniques to uh, investigate the how YouTube's um, takedown con copyright. Uh, takedown mechanisms, both content ID and DMCA systems, are being used by different actors and uh, for different types of content. Rosalie Gillett is um, using, again, machine learning classifiers to track how Twitter's um, responding to abuse against women on its networks. This is something that Twitter's long struggled with, but we can, we can eventually get to the point where we can measure how well they're doing, how, well they're being, how much they're being influenced by coordinated attacks, how, what the effect is of legal regime change around the world. It's really cool stuff, but it's just a small sampling of the great academic work that's being done around the world to try to develop more visibility into the commercial content moderation practices of major platforms. So in summary, I think we need new institutions. We need, from my perspective as an academic, we need new methods to be able to understand what's going on, which means also new partnerships and new ways of getting data from the platforms that have historically had trouble providing data about their internal processes. We need new institutions to figure out how we're actually going to do due process at scale. Facebook's oversight board is one example. Other countries have moved towards government regulators that might play a role in uh, hearing disputes about content. We're going to have to figure out how to, get, how to increase participation in creating the rules. The buzzword is multi-stakeholderism, but the buzzword has been multi-stakeholderism for a long time now, 30 years at least. Um, we haven't figured out how to do multi-stakeholderism in a good and legitimate way that actually helps people have a voice. We need, to, we need to invest more in that. And then we need better partnerships between journalists, civil society, academics, to hold both governments and platforms to account against the values that we care about. And then finally, for the regulators in the room, we need to figure out how exactly you craft regulation that works. Given that we are dealing with difficult incentives, difficult trade-offs and conflicting rights, you need to create a system that gets that incentive right without creating undue incentives either to, um, to not get involved or undue incentives to take too much of a risk-averse approach and remove legitimate content. And you need to create systems that have legitimate appeals processes. This is where I think we can improve systems like the Abhorrent Violent Material Act quite a bit by building in a better review process. We need to do some more study here, looking around the world at this moment where everyone's trying different approaches to figure out what works well and what doesn't. 
that's it for me. Um, if you want more information, my book is available for free online on the um, Open Science Foundation's website. It's called Lawless. It's out this year, or last, late last year with Cambridge. I'm happy to take questions, but thank you so much for your time. Yes, we do have time for a couple of questions with Nick. We're running behind, but we don't care. Um, uh, so we'll have just a couple of questions directed directly at Nick. But um, after that, we'll be moving straight into a panel that will involve Nick and Anupam with a couple of other <coughs> local commentators. So don't feel too like nervous. There's going to be a lot more discussion following on. Um, so any questions for Nick? So I wanted to ask about the role of artificial intelligence in filtering some of the uh, offensive content. Um, there have been examples of where a person places a picture of Adolf Hitler on Facebook and it's taken down because it violates community standards. And subsequently that person will put up an image of Mao, of Pol Pot and Stalin and it won't be taken down. And so the, the filter, the AI, is working according to a bias. And if you're going to handle you know, millions, if not billions, of these uh, f of this f through uh, incidents in, through the filtering process, how is the AI going to be regulated? And if second part of the question is, if we're looking to base this new constitutionalism on human rights, there is also a human right to free expression. The First Amendment enshrines this, and so the case of taking down the, the Daily Stormer effectively is a violation of that right. But it's a private. Uh, enterprise or, or vehicle that actually does that and effectively contravenes what is ultimately a constitutional um, amendment. Just wanted to get your perspective on that. Great. Two excellent questions. So the first question is, what's the role of uh, AI and particularly machine learning in content moderation? This is something that is getting better every day, right? Um, it, and you can't talk about it as any sort of monolithic application of AI to, to any of these problems. These are very different use cases of different types of content on different platforms um, that you're trying to detect and enforce. So there are some categories where um, machine learning is actually really effective, where we're really good at finding spam because we've been doing it for 20, 30 years, and we know what spam looks like, or at least we know what the old commercial spam looks like. We're rapidly starting to learn how coordinated, inauthentic behavior, I think is the, is the buzzword of the day, uh, also looks like, and we're getting better at developing um, uh, classifiers that can identify or predict um, when, when a post is, is essentially spam. We're very good at hash matching of existing images uh, that we know are, um, are ought to be prohibited. So the, the GIF-CT um, uh, database of extremist content, the uh, database of um, child exploitation material is very good at finding exact images and is getting better at finding slightly manipulated images. So where is it not working? Well, it's not working anywhere that you need a lot of context. Um, so hate speech is a really important category here. That in order to understand whether something is hateful, you need to understand what the person is trying to convey when they're posting that me message. And so you don't want a system that removes counter speech. You don't want a, a system that removes um, the people drawing attention to abuses of power. But you do want a system that removes people praising abuses of power. This is really difficult. Um, the, other, the other area that automated detection is not working on is anything new. Um, by definition, so the, the way that we train these systems is they're trained on the outputs of the previous runs of the content moderation system. So every iteration, they get better at learning what we're currently detecting. When you have something new or something very rare, like the Christchurch massacre, for example, we thankfully don't have enough training data to be able to predict that, catch that in advance. I say thankfully because we would need a lot more massacres live streamed in order to train a classifier to be able to detect that reliably and differentiate it from games footage or other, or, or movie, movie footage. <coughs> 
Um, so I think that there, is, there are great advances in some applications of machine learning to some of these problems, but progress is not uniform. I think what we're also seeing is a, a lot of investment. So every day or every month at least, these, are, these systems are getting better to the point where you might be comfortable handing off primary decision making to the classifier and then only getting the humans involved for review. Um, at the sort of scale we're talking about, that's probably the sort of end goal that we need to aim for uh, if we want consistent application. The second question is the conflict of rights issues. So, yes, freedom of speech is a fundamental human right, freedom of expression. What is important to recognise is that I didn't say we should adopt the US First Amendment as our guiding star for content moderation. Not many people outside of the US would agree that that is a, a good way to go. The advantage of human rights law is that it recognises that none of these rights are absolute, that there is always a balancing process. I think by anchoring in human rights law, for me, one of the main theoretical advantages is that you hook into a community who've spent a lot of time discussing how rights intersect. One of the challenges of technology regulation and the practices of private actors has been we've, we've had a sort of tech exceptionalism, that these rules have tried to have been developed to balance fundamental concerns in society that have long existed, but without learning necessarily from that larger and longer history. So I think by anchoring within human rights, you get access to the infrastructure. You get the international human rights organizations, you get civil society groups who will lobby on both sides of that argument. It doesn't provide a determinative answer. That's really important to note. If you, if you care about human rights, it means that there is no, it doesn't mean that there's a single answer to the really tricky problems that we've been talking about today. What it means is that there's a language to work through the processes, to work through the decision making about uh, how you create rules that address the harm that you want to address without causing undue harm to other rights. And I think that balancing that's inherent in, um, in proportionality analyses in human rights is, provides the, the language that's been missing from a lot of this discourse so far.